This is a production of Cornell University. Welcome to Book Sandwiched In, which has uh, beyond today one more event. Uh, I have found it all year to be an amazing series when English professors come and talk in a personal way about what inspires them and um, makes them specialize in the things that they work on. Um, it has been just such a privilege to have uh, everyone come to speak who has spoken, including Professor Hutchinson, uh, last time. Uh, but today I get to introduce uh, my friend Dag Wupschett, uh, named one of America's best professors in some poll or other and generally Lies. totally, totally <laughs> amazing human being. I will let him talk about himself and his work, but I will just say welcome. Um, feel free after that I speak to A, ask questions, and B, hang around and just talk to those of us who are English faculty about any questions you might have about the program. Not all of you are English majors. Those of you who are English majors might not be meeting sufficiently with your advisors. So talk to us. We're here to answer your questions. We're here to help you out. And we're here to you know, make a community together about our love of books, which are always a little bit more than merely sandwiched. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Masha, uh, for organizing this. Um, I'm um, going to share material from a book I've been working on for many, many, many years uh, that finally will come out uh, this April. It started out as my dissertation, and then I took um, several years to transform it into a book. Um, and it's on, and you, you, you'll hear this in, in uh, some of the pieces that I'll read. It's on the early era of AIDS uh, from 1981 to 1996. 96 is when, uh, you know, the AIDS cocktail, life-preserving AIDS uh, uh, cocktail drugs become available so that AIDS is not uh, a death sentence. Uh, but in the first decade and a half of the epidemic, you know, this is uh, an epidemic that uh, killed millions and millions of people and also uh, a group of artists uh, in this country in the 80s, particularly gay artists. And I focus, the book really focuses on artists who were um, mourning the death of loved ones, friends, lovers, but also anticipating their own impending death. So when they are writing poems, when they are coming up with choreographies, when they're painting, uh, that the, the morning that they are uh, uh, generating uh, speaks to, uh, again, the, the passing of, you know, people very dear to them and also more broadly a generation of gay men and their own, their reckoning with their own impending uh, death. And I thought uh, that body of work issued its own distinct poetics and it was trying to identify that. Um, so what I'm going to do today is, we'll see, I have, um, and, and the book is organized around genres. So there's the introduction from which I'll, 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 I'll read a bit, uh, and then uh, there's a chapter on the elegy, um, and then there's another chapter on the obituary. I have a chapter on uh, the visual uh, artist, the pop uh, uh, art sensation from the 1980s, Keith Haring. And then in the last chapter, I look at, I take a more comparative approach and look at um, the work of AIDS orphans in Ethiopia. Uh, you know, uh, children who've lost uh, both of their parents to AIDS. And I look at the first AIDS art collective in Ethiopia founded in the 90s. Um, how these children who had to, you know, uh, also contend with this catastrophe, how they think about loss and mourning, all right? Um, okay, so I'll begin, this is a project, it's also very personal to me, so I thought I'd, sh I'd begin with the preface of, uh, of the book. For the living, there is no constituency as formative as the dead. A fact I learned growing up in 1980s Ethiopia, where loss governed time and temperament. I remember those mornings when a death announcement would break the day like an alarm clock. Once the curfew exploded, expired at dawn, someone from the neighborhood Adir would take to the streets, blowing a horn and calling out the deceased name, alerting neighbors to the death that had occurred overnight. That same day, the first day, the Adir would pitch a tent in front of the bereaved home, and for three full days, the tent and the house would brim with mourners and keening. 
the expression of unchecked feeling would begin to subside slowly by the seventh day, and then continue to ease by the fortieth day, and the eightieth, and then by the first year, and then the seventh year, the wake days through which Ethiopians measure time. In the world of my childhood, it was a given that the dead determined how the living kept time, that the boundary between private and public grief was blurry, and that mourners were uninhibited in showing their grief, moaning, shouting, sobbing, keening, and heaving their bodies. Death in the Ethiopia of the 1980s was not merely a natural fact of life, however, nor mourning dictated exclusively by the cultural rites and the calendar of loss. Our lives were also seized by the Derg's reign of mass death. I am part of a generation of Ethiopians called Yadergilij, the Derg's children, born after the 1974 revolution that toppled Emperor Haile Selassie and put in power Colonel Mangustu Haile Mariam and the Derg's communist regime. During the sh short interval of Derg rule from 1974 to 1991, more than a million Ethiopians died as a direct rule of the junta's policies of terror, violence, war, and tyranny. As children of the revolution, we were exposed to mass violence, roundups and killings, corpses in city gutters, and survivors denied the remains of their beloved who had been shot to death unless to redeem the body, the mourners paid for the cost of the bullets the government had used in the execution. Between sunrise and the midnight curfew, we honed a sense of loss in keeping with Ethiopia's elaborate tradition of mourning what the sound of a brass horn signified at daybreak, what the sight of raised tents signaled, what the call and response of keening entailed, how grief was embodied and embroidered, how the timeline of loss was calculated. And inevitably, we also developed a heightened political sense of loss, how the state used death as a political instrument, how it disposed of its despised citizens, how it exacerbated how it exercised authority over the living and the dead, how it exacerbated grief by denying or delaying the bereaved from carrying out the work of mourning that was their birthright. The despised dead I grew up who constituted Ethiopia's macabre landscape in the 1980s were the casualties of terror, war, famine, and repression. The AIDS dead, the subjects of this book, had yet to figure into Ethiopian consciousness in the 1980s, even though at the time they had begun to fill graveyards and to fuel political movements in my future home, the United States. AIDS did not become a public matter and crisis in Ethiopia until the mid-1990s, after Derg rule had collapsed. In the first decade of the epidemic's history, AIDS was not a domestic issue. Because of the extreme censorship under the Derg, it was not an issue at all. For the duration of the decade, we were kept unaware of the new epidemic raging elsewhere in the world. I was 13 when I moved to the United States in 1989. But unlike 13-year-olds who grew up in this country who had at least an inchoate sense of the raging epidemic, I had absolutely no knowledge of AIDS. I vaguely recall first learning about it in a health education class in high school and later in college, eventually picking up on what it commonly signified in America, a gay disease. My perception of AIDS changed, however, when I came out at 22 and began to read the writing of it, the generation of gay men who had immediately preceded me. I sought out their work to find the vocabulary with which to voice my own unarticulated feelings stories to corroborate my own queer longings, truths to free me up from the deep sense of shame and fear that dogged my late teens. What I read did all of that and more. It was liberating to read works by Melvin Dixon, Essex Hemphill, Paul Manette, and a host of other gay writers whose self-ownership was decisive in my sexual coming of age. But with its focus on AIDS and the deaths of a generation of gay men, this body of writing was also devastating, and it became formative in ways I didn't anticipate. I realized that many of my immediate gay forebears were gone, cut down prematurely by a catastrophe that was allowed to rage. And each poem I read, each memoir, each testimony, tallied death with a deep sense of pathos and politics that gripped me like the losses of my childhood. In the late 1990s, 
At the same time, I was discovering the mass deaths of my queer forebears. My childhood friends, indeed a generation of Ethiopian men and women my age, began to die in droves of AIDS-related illnesses. From my neighborhood alone, Nabiyu, who lived two houses to the right of us and had the height of the sky, Eske, who lived across the street and had color like the highland sun, and Ephraim, four houses to the left, whose sweet talk disarmed my world, young men with whom I shared the deepest boyhood friendship, love, and longing, died back to back within a year. And while working on this book over the past decade, I lost many more friends and family members whose deaths, like other AIDS deaths in Ethiopia, were swathed in shame and silence. However much this is a scholarly study of the early years of AIDS, my sense of mourning is colored by these formative experiences of loss, which traverse boundaries and identities. Although I did not know them in the flesh, I have lived closely with the dead who populate this book, shored up by their fierce courage, vision, and tenderness. Disprised in their own time, they continue to be disavowed in ours. This book is a modest effort to speak again their mourning and to reanimate lives that demand remembering. So that's the preface and the introduction begins, um, you know, doing the archival research, um, I thought, what could be a good narrative hook to start the introduction? And one of the most devastating uh, pieces, archival pieces that I've come across was a, a small footage of uh, a, a political funeral of Tim Bailey. Will, God, here. We're going to, we're going to interfere with... Yeah, we have a dead body here. 
As police and pallbearers fought, the casket carrying the body of Tim Bailey tipped and nearly struck the asphalt. In that flash moment, over the chaos, one of the mourners began to shout, you've dropped the dead. He wailed it again, you've dropped the dead. And again, you've dropped the dead. Each cry piercing the embattled funeral procession. Anticipating his own 1993 death, Bailey, a gay AIDS activist, a member of ACT UP New York and its affinity group, The Marys, had committed his remains in the service of an activist funeral, willing his body to have a political afterlife. At first, Bailey told his friends and fellow AIDS activists that, quote, he wanted his body thrown over the White House gates because he was enraged by the government's lethargy, outright inhumanity in confronting the AIDS crisis, unquote. While they shared his commitment to making his corpse a subject of both mourning and politics, Bailey's friends couldn't bear to discard their beloved's <laughs> remains. Quote, we told him we couldn't throw his body over the gates, not because we didn't share his fury, but because we loved him too much to treat his mortal remains that way, unquote. In his final days, Bailey instructed them, all right, do something formal and aesthetic in front of the White House. I won't be there anyway, it'll be for you, unquote. The Marys, in concert with other ACT UP activists, carried out Bailey's wish, staging an extraordinary event of mourning and militancy. It was the Marys who introduced the open casket funeral into ACT UP's repertoire of direct actions as an act concretizing and consecrating those who died of AIDS. Open, casket, open caskets forced the public to see the dead and disavowed, while honoring those despised dead with public rights and recognition. Just months before Bailey's funeral, the Marys had carried out their first political funeral for one of their members, Mark Lowe Fisher, in the streets of New York City. Now they were in the nation's capital with the body of another member and friend who had died as the epitaph on the processional banner stated, quote, of AIDS complications, government neglect, greed, and indifference. Bailey's political funeral was held on July 1st, 1993, three days after his death. Early that day, members of the Marys picked up the body from a funeral home in New Jersey and drove the Van Hearst to Washington, D.C., arriving on the Capitol grounds shortly after midday. They were greeted by scores of activists who had driven down on two chartered buses from New York to honor Bailey's last wishes to do something formal and aesthetic, an open casket procession of his body from the Capitol to the White House. When the van with Bailey's casket arrived in Washington, it was met not only by activist mourners, however, but also by armed, undercover, and uniformed police, whose goal was to keep the corpse of a person with AIDS from appearing in public. It didn't matter that Bailey survivors, including his executor and his brother, had come armed with the deceased will and other legal permits, not to mention a group of insurgent mourners determined to carry out his last wishes. While the procession could go on, the police insisted, the body could not be displayed openly. Surrounded by mourners and police, Bailey's body became the subject of a siege. At first, the police tried to stymie the public display of the body by drawing out the occasion, calling in more officials to vet the survivor's documents, and a coroner to verify the body as dead. The siege went on from 1 o'clock in the afternoon to about 6 o'clock at night, and erupted at the end when the mourners resolved to take the body out, insisting to the police, quote, This is a nonviolent political funeral procession for Tim Bailey. This is not a demonstration. This is a funeral procession. We're going to proceed with this coffin to the White House as a funeral procession, unquote. And again, with palpable rage, what the hell are you afraid of? That maybe ordinary citizens will see what the government is doing? Is that what you are afraid of? That people may get to see exactly what the government does? We have a dead body here. We have a corpse. Why the hell do we have to hide a corpse? Don't pull it out. Do not pull it out, an officer ordered the pallbearers. Place it back. As the body came out, the police confronted the rows of activists who had formed a human chain to shield the casket and the pallbearers. With wanton violence, the police began their attack, tearing up the group, grabbing one activist by the nape, putting another in a chokehold, tackling others to the, to the ground, 
No violence, no violence, no violence, the activists called out in unison, fighting to maintain their grip and barrier. The casket tilted precariously as the police forced their way toward it, and it almost came crashing down as they began ramming the pallbearers in the casket into the van. In that moment, one mourner began to keen, you've dropped the dead. The sound and substance of his anguish as haunting and material as the tumbling coffin. Somehow, the pallbearers managed to land the body safely inside the hearse. The violence against the dead and the living soon subsided, and the funeral came to a close. The van was escorted off the Capitol grounds, then out of town, by patrol cars that followed it all the way to Baltimore, an hour away. Ba Bailey's close, closest friends then drove on with the body to New Jersey and returned it to the funeral home. The corpse they had retrieved in the morning was returned hours later, re-embodied with a remarkable posthumous life and political agency. Uh, so that's how the, um, I begin the book. Uh, and this is a, 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 um, a scene shot by uh, James Wincy. Uh, and this is just a, a short version of it. And in fact, uh, Croc Library, uh, the human sexual, sexuality collection, has um, you know, just uh, VHS tapes after VHS tapes of uh, things that he shot, political funerals. Uh, all kinds of uh, act up uh, demonstration. So I was trying to orchestrate this narrative using the film, but also many people have written about this in their memoirs or mention it in their memoirs, uh, and also oral history projects. So kind of suturing these different archives as a kind of narrative hook. Um, uh, let's see. Maybe I could read. So I said, you know, I, I I start with this with this narrative, and then I go on to talk about maybe the conceptual. Uh, terms of the project. Um, so maybe the language changes slightly. Uh, okay. With its striking emotional, political, and aesthetic significance, as well as its unique timeline of loss, this extraordinary work of mourning exemplifies other works of early AIDS grief considered in this book. The calendar of loss revisits the early years of the AIDS pandemic from 1981, when the first cases were reported to 1996, when effective antiretroviral therapy was introduced. Looking back, it focuses particularly on the efforts of early AIDS mourners like Bailey, who grieved their own impending death alongside the deaths of many others. The formal and political character of their grief confounds and traverses the limits of mourning in ways that demand careful study. Works of early AIDS mourning, including both published writing and other forms of speech, such as political funeral, funerals, are steeped in what I call a poetics of compounding loss. These narratives of mourning do not recount, respond to, and reflect upon singular events of mourning, but instead explicitly underscore, are in, are in some ways almost deliriously obsessed with and full of rage over the serial and repetitive nature of, loss, of the losses they confront. These mourners deal with the deaths of lovers and friends one after another in rapid succession and in devastatingly contracted spans of time. This is such a central element of the collective trauma of queer life in the 1980s and 90s that a trope of inventory taking surfaces time and again as a haunting lit motif in this body of mourning. The theme appears in various forms, lists of the dead, series of names, estimates of body counts, and phrases such as one by one and beyond counting. The inventory taking signifies for these queer mourners both the devastation in their own lives, lover after lover, friend after friend, and the collective devastation in the lives of countless others like them. But compounding loss connotes not merely an overwhelming quantity or scale. In addition, the negative aspects, the pain, the confounded psyche, the exhausted body and soul of each loss are compounded by the memory and experiences of the losses just before. The time, consolation, and closure that allow the bereaved to move on are for these mourners painfully aborted. This is precisely why Melvin Dixon, one of the exemplary figures of AIDS poetry, chooses not to write a series of elegies to each lost beloved, but instead writes the single poem, and these are just a few, as a commemoration of all his lost lovers and close friends. Stanza by stanza, the loss compounds. The serial losses these writers confront provide the context for yet another trope, 
the chilling reflexivity of the subject's mourning. With each passing lover, with the mounting numbers of the dead, the bereaved is provided with yet more evidence of the certain fatality of the virus also at work inside him. He mourns not only past deaths, but also impending ones, including his own. The poetics of compounding loss is thus a phrase meant to capture the most salient formal characteristics of this body of literature, the litmotif of inventory taking, the reconceptualization of relentless <coughs> serial losses, not as cumulative, but as compounding, and the notion that this compounded loss is heightened by reflexivity, with the subject's loss both object and subject, past and prospective, memory and immediate threat. Despite the complexity and dexterity of these literary texts, the tableau of Eight's Morning during this period would be incomplete without the inclusion of other genres beyond creative writing. Obituaries, protest paraphernalia and protest speech, and funerals were all part of what happened and should be brought into the analysis. Funerals, whether private or public, were rife with conflict and often included explosive and artful political acts of speech and defiance. As Bailey's funeral illustrates, the key motifs included the breaking of silence, fury over government inaction, and ultimately a vociferous refusal by these mourners living with and dying of AIDS to quietly accept their conditions as what I call disprized mourners, the bereaved who are denied the rights, honor, and the dignity of public mourning, and whose losses are instead shrouded in silence, shame, and disgrace. And yet these mourners turn to their sorrow as a necessary vehicle of survival. Silence equals death, the clarion call of early AIDS activism, put open, truthful mourning at the center of their protest, insisting that lives could be saved through the very speech acts precipitated by death. In carefully choreographed acts of mourning and provocation, for instance, ACT UP dumped crematory ashes on the lawn of the White House and staged open casket funerals in the streets of New York City and Washington, D.C. These acts of speech and embodiment, full of wit and biting political commentary, and often dramatically and artfully choreographed, are central to the archive of early AIDS loss. They show the insurgent uses of mourning for the ostracized, and also illuminate the rich interplay between the aesthetics and politics of grief. The unique formal and extra-formal dimensions of this body of mourning have significant implications for the way we theorize loss. The mourning I address in this book departs from the paradigmatic psycho psychoanalytic theory of loss, Sigmund Freud's mourning and, mo and melancholia. The chief reason the mourning versus melancholia paradigm falls short is because it, fa it fails to envisage the exceedingly perilous life these subjects inhabit, a life where death is not a singular lost object, but instead is ever-present, and where the mourner is also dying. The entire co concept of transference is meaningfully altered here, shaped by a preoccupation with a lost object that is not only external, but is also the self. A more appropriate theoretical lens for this body of work as the paradigm of loss that underwrites African-American mourning, more, point, more poignantly captured in slave songs and spirituals. The paradigm of black mourning accommodates the work of early AIDS mourners in important ways, especially in the insistence that death is ever present, that death is somehow always impending, and that survivors can confront all this death in the face of shame and stigma in eloquent ways that also imply a fierce political sensibility and a longing for justice. Coming out of the intersection of African diaspora and queer studies, the calendar of loss also expands to include another class of mourners devastated by this catastrophe. I end the study with a comparative look at AIDS orphans mourning in Africa. I draw on the work of Sudden Flowers, the first AIDS art collective in Ethiopia, which is mainly composed of children between the ages of 9 and 17 who've lost their parents to AIDS. Through a range of forms, text, photography, performance, public installation, and film, the collective has produced a remarkable body of art to counter the silence and stigma of AIDS in Ethiopia. A comparative look at the work of Sudden Flowers <coughs> shows how the dis these disparaged children, bereft of parents and shunned by the world around them, articulate a formal sense of compounding loss and other feelings of despised grief. 
in their self-willed representations. These children picture themselves not merely as objects of adults' gaze and sentiment, but as subjects who employ grief to enfranchise themselves. Indeed, these children speak of their own disparaged lives as AIDS orphans and a world ravaged by this pandemic in ways that hauntingly echo the sorrow of gay men across the Atlantic. In their respective countries, in the early years of the epidemic, and amid a violent public sphere, both classes of AIDS mourners embodied AIDS openly and fearlessly, manifesting and mourning their beloved dead, whom their compatriots, compatriots refused to see and grieve. Along with this fierce agency, these children's mourning also shares a poetics of loss that is distinctly queer, iterating a grammar of death that is unfixed and issuing a calendar of loss for a precarious future. Arraying side by side the sorrow of orphans from Africa and that of queer communities from America opens up innovative ways of thinking together the shared grief of the disparate constituencies profoundly impacted by this catastrophe. Informed by black queer critical practice, the calendar of loss also eschews a model of AIDS scholarship that isolates people of color in a separate chapter, away from and contingent on the experiences of white gay men, or gestures to them parenthetically as if an afterthought. Drawing on a diverse set of characters and archives, the book reconstructs the early era of AIDS differently, elucidating, elucidating together my central claims about the formal <coughs> properties of compounding loss, the political uses of disprized grief, and the theoretical insights of black sorrow. Yeah, let me pause there. Questions, questions. AIDS grief, particularly with the AIDS orphans, yeah. um, because uh, a lot of them have gotten it passed on sort of from dead parents. Like I know, um, yeah. like I have a lot of experience with AIDS orphans who have gotten it from parents who died, like mothers who died in childbirth, or it's, it's passed on like, I guess, in vitro. I'm not really sure how that works medically, but yes. um, do you treat that at all and how that connects with um, the the sort of 1980s um, gay experience of like inheriting that sorrow? Yeah. Ah, oh, man, I wish you'd asked that question a few years ago. <laughs> because I would have used that, I like the term, inheritance is a, an operative term, right? Um, the way I think about it, so what, what I've done, I, that, that chapter really, I mean, I look at, you know, their performances and uh, uh, photographs, but I focus on um, le a, a, a kind of unique genre. Uh, I call them epistles to the dead. These are letters that these kids are writing to their deceased parents. So, you know, these are, between, as I said, between 9 and um, 18. Now, if you're an Amharic speaker, uh, especially the young kids because of young age uh, and intermittent schooling, and these are kids who come from, uh, you know, um, to say the very humble backgrounds, right, that uh, initially what's jarring for an Amharic uh, speaker is their, their penmanship has yet to settle, mm -hmm. right? And so reading it, I, I stammer initially because I have to, you know, tweak characters, diacritics to, to hear it, right? Uh, in addition to that, uh, what I find very unique about these set of letters is that when the kids talk about death, they don't um, resort to adult Ethiopian adult conventions of talking about death. Now, Ethiopians are, it's a very religious society. So when you talk about death, there's almost a kind of knee-jerk reaction to talk about it using religious idiom, right? And that kind of idiom is almost absent from these set of letters. Furthermore, they talk about their parents, the recurring term is separation. Separated from my mother, separated from my father. And the word death itself, appears in a set of about 60 letters that I looked at, uh, astonishingly, in, a, in only one letter, right? And the most common Ameri American, Ethiopian euphemism, Amharic euphemism for talking about death is maref, which means to rest. To, to rest. Right, you may correct me on this. Uh, uh, since we have a, an Amharic speaker, I, I don't want to, I'm, I'm telling the truth. She can, uh, <laughs> um, right? So th uh, they don't use that, uh, 
the common adult euphemism. So I was interested, okay, so how do children uh, bear loss, right? Uh, because we take it for granted as adults, we have elegies, we have obituaries, we have funerals. These are adult conventions that are meant to, you know, that shore us up. It's impossible to imagine human life without these conventions, right? But children who, who, who don't have that kind of resource, what do they do? So what, at least what I was able to glean from these letters was, uh, again, a kind of unfixed sense, a timeline of death of separation. So there are other letters that uh, they're, they're kind of, they're imperative for the parents to appear, you know, as if, you know, they've only, as if they're sharing a contiguous world, right? And not, you know, another world that the dead inhabit. Uh, and, uh, and the way in which death is unfixed seemed to echo a lot of the uh, rhetorical strategies of these gay men who are also anticipating their own death. Right, so the grammar of loss is unfixed in that instance, where you know, convention or tradi conventionally speaking, loss we think of it in the past tense, but when you're dying and you're anticipating your death in the future, loss takes on a future orientation too. So, formally, I was trying to link uh, these things. In addition to these are also d these are orphans disparaged, marginal in, in in Ethiopian context, gay men also in the 1980s. These are also, uh, you know. Kind of periphery of American pop. Can you just tell us what the full title of the book is? It's called The Calendar of Loss, uh, Race, Sexuality, and Mourning in the Early Era of AIDS. Um, initially, for a long time, the working title was Looking for the Dead. Um, and in part, that was more about me looking, you know, again, because I didn't know, and it's, you know, what I said in the preface, having arrived here in 1989, even if I was a kid here, that would have been part of my, you know, kind of consciousness, and it wasn't. So I said, looking for the dead, because it's, it's been that. The book for me has been trying to recover um, and look for uh, the dead. And then someone said, ah, since you're really talking about uh, this unique grammar, this unique poetics, uh, uh, why not call it the grammar of loss? But ultimately, it's not really about grammar, it's about time. Right, uh, the way in which this work, this body of work, manipulates the the timeline of loss. So, uh, the calendar of loss, I think, is a better title ultimately. So. No, I was so struck by the the language itself, uh, the beauty of the the personal tone, right, and how amazing it is that you still balance a critical gaze. Uh, how easy was that for you? <laughs> well, I appreciate that coming from a poet. Uh, um, you know, it's uh, initially, I think, you know, there was a kind of fidelity to the material itself, right? When, you know, these are men mourning using, I think sometimes theoretical language or academic jargon could, could, could be distancing and alienating. And I didn't want to something that's so intimate to me to use that language to, because it would mean, you know, distancing my own emotional attachment to the, to the project. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, ooh, a lot of men, the number of drafts I've gone through, uh, but with that attention, okay, how can I polish the prose? How can, this word, is it doing anything? Can I get, you know, um, and also trying to, um, pull the theory from the, the material itself and not the other way around. Like I'm not approaching it using, you know, as I mentioned, psychoanalytic theories of, or other theories of loss. So, it, you know, I'm trying to work out the very conceptual terms from the material itself. And I think that, that helps you, that helps set the tone mm -hmm. of the prose, even when you're trying to conceptualize something. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. yeah, and I think not not being a native speaker also helps. Yeah, yeah. I think so. I think so. Uh, I'm still looking at you know words in the dictionary constantly uh, uh, um, in that way of trying to own. St I'm still trying to own the language. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, Which uh, it's fascinating that you the 
um, the the um, the slave songs yes. uh, and that form of mourning, which when language falls apart, exactly. uh, is so useful uh, in, in in your work. Exactly, and there too, that's it's also a, uh, you know as someone who studies African American literature and queer literature, I wanted to use you know read. I mean, looking at the kind of arc of the Af African American literature from slave narrative to this day, one dominant theme is this idea of the death-bound subject. I mean, slave narrative is full of it, right? The idea of one that families could be disbanded, whim of you know, families could be separated, and also that I could face, you know, death in, in different in different kinds of ways. Looking at lynching material, e you know, looking at even civil rights material, even now, right? And I thought there was a particular insight in that material of how to think about death both as past and prospective. Mm -hmm. So why not use the vernacular, especially with spirituals, because it's much more concentrated, why not use that vernac vernacular material as a legitimate body of work from which to draw uh, theoretical insight and not immediately run to continental Europe to do so? You know, uh, and I think that, that at least in my head, I think there's a political, unstated maybe, but ele you know, um, enterprise to that too. Yes, Asha. So I was a teenager in the 80s. I was a young teenager in the 80s. And what I remember is that the sense you had in America in the 80s during the AIDS crisis was that Certainly if you were gay, and I was a queer female, so really this was an inaccurate sense, you were just condemned to death. Yeah. There was that sense that like, if you ever had sex, you would be condemned to death. Absolutely. And it was also somewhat true of straight kids. Like, everyone in the 80s, in my memory, was so scared that there was a sexually transmitted disease that could kill you. And of course, we know that many sexually transmitted diseases have not cared for him. But, but that sense that sex could kill, the stigma of yeah. sex, was this crippling weight as you were coming into sexuality. And so I think those yeah. of us who are of, I'm older than you, but of your generation, yeah. are sort of lived through that and had to survive it, and yeah. were very much helped in surviving it, straight or gay, by the work of ACT UP, um, which was an activist, performative work of reclaiming sex from stigma, Indeed. among other things. Indeed. And then in 96, suddenly it was like something you could live with. And I don't know if you guys know, but now, now there's actually an AIDS vaccine that is very expensive. You have to be quite, you know, well insured to use it. But you can take a vaccine, have all the unprotected sex you want, and be fine. We are actually in a new place historically as of last year. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just, it, the world has changed again. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask you to talk about that, about life after 96 and okay. life after... 2014. Sure. I'm glad you said what you said at the out, at the beginning, Masha, yeah. because that's something talking to... No, they don't remember that. Yeah. I don't know what they think <laughs> sex is going to do to them, but I don't think they think they're going to drop dead. Drop dead, <laughs> yeah. But I thought we would. Yeah, it's funny, you remind me of my partner says this, growing up in this country where he, you know, as, as a little boy, as an eight, nine-year-old, with sense of his own queer self, even at that age, where he would go to a CVS and would read the tabloids, like, gay disease going to destroy, you know, like, big block. Rock Hudson. Exact rock. And that, he re being terrified by that. Like, is that me? Is that, in a way that, you know, thank God for censorship sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that I didn't have to uh, deal with that kind of stuff. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so I had to, bra well, Yes, I bracket the book, I mean, uh, it ends in 96 until we get to the last chapter in Ethiopia, and that's from 99 to, I think, 2004, in part because there's nothing to talk about in the, in, you know, AIDS really becomes an issue. Uh, you know, the first conference is held on AIDS in 1998. The government first issues its state, you know, uh, the... Organizations by people living with AIDS uh, begin to blossom in, in, in 98, 97, including Sudden Flowers, which uh, uh, start founded in 1999. Uh, so there's a shift in discourse where 96 comes, and in part engineered by conservative gay pundits, mm -hmm. where 
okay, now, now that AIDS is no longer a stigma that we have to mm -hmm. shoulder, let's, come up, let's reframe it so AIDS is an issue that affects people of color in the United States or the global south. Right, that to de-link that association that this is not the stigma that we have to shoulder at a time in the late 90s when people are trying to integrate uh, uh, queer folk into the American mainstream. Right? Uh, so I had to bracket it there in part because after 96 we have a very different discourse around AIDS. At least in the main in America we think of it as this is something that happens in Ethiopia or in Haiti or in so on and so forth. Right? Uh, and not, so I couldn't, it's, it would have been, uh, the idea of compounding loss wouldn't necessarily apply in the American context, right? Because just the death numbers dramatically drop after 96, even in communities. Real death numbers. Oh, yeah, That's yeah. That's the funny thing. Indeed. It's like we're behaving like there's nothing going on. Indeed. And I say this at the conclusion, so this is something I address in the conclusion to, to say I had to bracket it, but it isn't to gloss over the kind of uh, trauma and devastation that, that's, mm. you know, uh, AIDS still continues to, the kind of havoc it, it, it still continues to create. Um, so I would say the discourse one has, it, the post-AIDS discourse in the 90s has to be thought about in relation to gay integration into the mainstream. I think there's something, like when you're seeking integration, you want to say, we're no longer diseased. We're no longer, you know what I mean, mm -hmm. in this weird, messed up way. Now we're married. Now we're married, yeah. We went, we had like uh, Urvashi Vai, the great uh, activist, gay activist who, came, who was here last year, and said we went from outlaws to in-laws, <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, which, is, which, is, which is true. Um, Just uh, to clarify, so the yeah, Ethiopian okay. <clears throat> orphan stuff, that's also all pre-96, the stuff you're dealing with? No, so oh, this is 99. Oh. Exactly, because it's, it's, so AIDS really becomes, there's a kind of time lag, if you will. Mm -hmm. It really becomes an issue in the mid-1990s uh, in, mid mm -hmm. in Ethiopia, exactly. Uh, and when you look at the archive, there's almost nothing uh, from, the, from the 1980s. Uh, I found actually two articles, and they were, um, there was one, a paper in Zimbabwe who talked about the first case of AIDS being reported in Ethiopia in 1987 or something. But in the archives I looked at in Ethiopia, nothing in the 1990s, I mean in the 1980s. Um, uh, so, to, you know, with the vaccine, I mean, it depends. You know, if you go to Ethiopia, it's still an issue in many ways or other, other parts of the world, right? Um, yeah. Beginning of an answer, Masha. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I fully answered your question. One conversation. Indeed. Indeed. Question. Yeah. Trevor. Uh, what do you think the importance is of taking a global tragedy like AIDS and kind of grounding it in these personal narratives that you read a little bit about in the preface? These individual cases, almost like Tim Bailey. Forty plus million people died of AIDS. Right. You can't. It's you, you can't grasp that, right? It, statistics have a way of obscuring and kind of ob obfuscating, you know, kind of reality. Uh, so, um, and I think that's, ultimately, that's the power of narrative, right? It has a way to talk about and to picture even mass calamity, right? Uh, and make it tangible, make it palpable in a way that statistics can't, especially of a mass calamity like AIDS, right? Uh, and also the way in which calamities also engender their own responses, right? So, for instance, in the chapter on the obituary, I mean, it's amazing the you know in the obituary and mainstream obituaries initially, when someone died of AIDS, the euphemism was you know like for instance the great American choreographer, African American choreographer Alvin Ailey, Alvin Ailey, you know the great American died of a long illness. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. or someone died of a cardiac, or a long. Imagine what kind of long illness would kill you at thirty-five or thirty-two. At least the young men who are dying too. But consistently, that would be the thing that that would appear in mainstream publications. And then you had in the same college obituary. Magazines. God, I would be so mad at college alumni magazines. <coughs> right, a long illness. Exactly. Oh, long illness, cancer sometimes. Exactly, and survivors. Like so, in the genre of the obituary, 
there's also usually in the last paragraph or the penultimate paragraph, the kinship clause. So-and-so survived by his father, his mother. Mm -hmm. They would leave out deliberately uh, partners, right? So in gay periodicals like the New York Native, for instance, the same person, you'd look at the New York Times obituary mm -hmm. and then the New York Native obituary, I mean, they want to queer this stuff up, right? So there's the, the fact that he died of AIDS, but... Uh, and some of the ones that writers would write, oh, we had, an, you know, the orgies we attended, the, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's a deliberate reclamation of the very thing that the public is trying to deny, which is ultimately gay sex, right? Uh, uh, and the fear of gay sex and so on and so forth. So you see that in the native uh, publications. Yes? Yeah. That, that was a word that kind of caught my ear, I guess. Um, and do you treat that as like a, a specific term, or um, like do you set that up the like keening particularly as traditional against silence, or is that um, keening? You know, that's why I begin with um, the the preface and the. Uh, by the way, I use the term. It, it there is a burial society in Ethiopia, and it, it, they're common, right? Uh, and if you go to any Ethiopian wedding, be it in Ethiopia or even in this country, I, it's, you, you, you know, before you, it doesn't matter, if it's somebody's house, an apartment complex, before you enter the door, you hear that sound, that keening sound. Uh, and when you grow up... Wait, you said wedding? wedding. Keening. You said you, oh, wedding? did I say? Really? Not wedding, I said funeral. Oh. Oh, you said Oops. wedding. <laughs> They're kind of a funeral. They're kind of a funeral, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> indeed, no. Uh, uh, Ethiopian funeral, pardon me. Uh, you hear that sound, right? And so, for instance, when I hear, when I look at a, a footage like this, and then that moment when the, guy, when the guy, you don't see him, but he says, you've dropped the dead. I mean, that's immediately recognizable to me, given the kind of keening I'm so familiar with, right? And I come back to it at the end, uh, in a way that keening is something, maybe it's something that's not uh, kind of bounded, uh, it's not fixed. Uh, there's a, um, yeah, in general, this body of work, there's, a, there's an open-ended element quality to it because I'm going to be gone and somebody else is going to follow me, that kind of thing. And I think there's something about keening that also resists a summing up, if you will. Uh, so I come back to sound in the, in the, in the conclusion at the very end of the book. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.